Hi, I'm Jess Sullivan. I'm Associate Professor of Psychology, and I'm Faculty Director of the Shup Family Idea Lab. And today, I am here to talk to you about your questions related to artificial intelligence. Most of you who are listening are thinking about things like ChatGPT, chatbots, Google Translate, AI um, programs for generating selfies and generating art and stuff like that. And I'll be thinking about those things too. So let's get started with some questions. So Kyan LC asks, do you believe artificial intelligence by its most literal definition actually exists? I have my own criteria for artificial intelligence that I thought would never be met in my lifetime, and it has now been met. So I wanted something that could make me laugh by showing me something new. I wanted something that could pay attention to not just what language means, but how it sounds and the subtext of language. And large language models like ChatGPT can do that. So for me, it's ticked my boxes of artificial intelligence. But of course, intelligence isn't just being able to do language tricks. It's being able to be self-reflective. It's being able to ask the next question and make decisions based on what you think you should do next. And right now, to my knowledge, artificial intelligence cannot do that. So um, by that definition, I would say no. Lilwags18 says, are there ways to determine if content is real or created by humans versus AI? Um, the answer is sometimes, yeah. So there are websites, programs, and other tools you can use to try to identify whether something that you received came from, for example, ChatGPT. Um, there are also technical things you can do with graphical images, for example, to try to determine how they were created. Um, that said, is it possible that you could be tricked? Yes. <laughs> so there have been all sorts of lovely studies in the last few months basically giving professors AI-generated content and saying, hey, can you figure out just by reading it whether this came from AI or whether it didn't? And performance is not all that great. Um, so there are tools, and companies are really invested in being able to put their mark on their product, right? And so they want you to be able to figure out if it came from open AI versus Google versus something else. Um, but could you be tricked? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Just.treasure asks, when do you suggest we begin to involve ethics in AI usage? Uh, and I suggest early and often. Um, so when it comes to AI, I'm thinking about who gets to use it, so there's an issue of access. How are we using it? What are our human intentions when we use it? Are they um, towards good or towards less than good? I'm also thinking about how does the AI work? What information is it using? Um, there's a lot of conversation right now because these large language models are trained on content that is on the internet. And we know that internet content is biased. It contains all sorts of really harmful content. And so we have to be really careful in interpreting what we get out because it's going to be shaped by all the biases of the language and the computer programming and the questions that created the AI. Um, so that's a huge ethical concern as well. Boersma Jacob asks, are there any regulatory bodies policing what happens? I feel few people make decisions. Um, absolutely. <laughs> Part of this has to do with expertise. Very few people understand enough about computers and about language and about how these programs work to be able to monitor them. And when they are created by private companies, that challenge is even greater because a lot of times private companies don't want you to look under the hood. Regulation is going to be a big issue and, and we're probably a little bit behind where the technology is right now, though this is not my area of total expertise. So this question is from J. Bay Cura and they ask, how will AI affect human workforce displacement? It is hard to know, right? I wish I could see into the future. Um, it does seem like there are some really scary possibilities, right, where AI can do a lot of the tasks that are currently human only, and that moves towards, you know, having more and more people who are having difficulty getting employment and more and more companies that are getting super rich off of technology. On the other hand, AI can do all sorts of really annoying, boring tasks. It can do the dull work of, you know, product checking. It can do the dull work of writing some really boring and redundant computer code. And if there are ways to use human efforts in more creative, more embodied ways, that could be a really great development for the workforce. Um, but I can't know which direction we're going to go in. Annie Obrecht, I believe, asks, uh, can or when does AI become dangerous? Uh, if you want to have like nightmares for weeks, go ahead and Google the singularity. Uh, <laughs> the idea there is that you have AI uh, that has 
outperformed humans to such a degree that we can no longer control it. Um, and even if you program your AI to be good and delightful and do nice things, if it does that too much, it will still obliterate all of humanity. And we would never see it coming. So whoa, singularity, very, very scary. Um, but AI is dangerous in other ways too, or potentially dangerous, right? So you could imagine using it to make legal decisions, decisions about who gets financial assistance and who doesn't, healthcare decisions. And you could imagine that all of those biases that might worry us about how AI works could help inform those decisions, leading to worse social problems. And I should say that there are a lot of um, organizations at universities, both locally and around the nation, that are really focused on thinking about these ethical issues. Uh, Bella F20 says, will it fully replace art? Does it have the capacity for original ideas? Uh, I would be surprised if AI replaced the role of the artist. Artists can do things at this point that AI cannot. So for example, AI cannot decide to create a painting without you telling it to at this moment. And in fact, if you just say create a painting, it's not going to have the same types of um, creative ideas without human input that a human could have, right? So even the best AI that's publicly available right now, you have to tell it to do something for it to do something. And so really you're working in some kind of a partnership with AI. Now that can have some scary implications for artists who are likely already struggling to make ends meet and are really worried about things like intellectual property, right? Like this is my creative style and now AI is just stealing it. Um, I think that those are really real concerns. Um, but I think Bella's question where she asks, um, does it have the capacity for original ideas? The answer is at this point, no. It can't know to ask that next question or do that next piece of art or shift their style without you telling it to do so, at least not yet. Dragonfire944 asks, what do you wish AI was being used for more or at all? Um, that's a great question. I think that using it to outsource that um, that first pass as you're doing like a numerical problem, as you're doing a language problem, as you're trying to figure out, you know, what should I call my new band? Honestly, it kind of feels like, you know, whose line is it anyway, or like an improv where you just ask the audience for 15 ideas. It's really good at generating 15 interesting ideas. And then you as the human, your job is to look at all those ideas and decide, well, which ones are actually interesting? Which ones are good? How can I change them to make them even better? Um, so using AI to do that brainstorm phase uh, in an academic context when it's allowed to do so, right, um, I think is really, really valuable. I also use it to help me with computer coding, to help me change um, code from one coding language to another. Um, I think that using it to facilitate those kinds of simple tasks can be a real time saver and can help save the human brain for what it does best, which is wondering and imagining, stuff that AI can't do. Bad Galili asks, can we please remove math from general requirements if AI can do it for us? Um, sure. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you, you definitely can't. Math class isn't really there to just teach you to do calculations because a computer can do that, a calculator can do that, and increasingly AI can do that. Um, it's there to teach you how to think about which calculations need to be done and how to do them. And when I do a math problem and I use ChatGPT to help me, I have to use my human brain and my human expertise to evaluate, did it do a good job or did it do a really terrible job? And I fear that without a math requirement, we wouldn't be able to assess that. All right, bonus, how might AI disrupt education as we know it? Um, right now, among my friends, there are like three groups. Uh, one group who like just learned about the newest developments in AI and are like, oh, ooh, I'm not sure, I've got to think about this. One group who are absolutely panicking, right? Will this mean that students will cheat? Will this mean that I will be out of a job? Is there a role for a tutor or a teacher? Um, now that we have really strong AI that's publicly and freely available, at least for now. The third group is kind of more my camp, which is sweet, we have like a new tool, right? Now when I explain a complicated statistical analysis, I can say, if you don't understand it, come to my office hour. But before you do that, ask ChatGPT like three or four times to explain it to you in different ways. And we can talk about which of those explanations made the most sense and the least sense to you, and then use that to figure out how to help you. So I see it as this amazing, like a super calculator that can help us get started, that can help us refine our ideas, and can almost serve as a uh, inaccurate, we can't always trust it, uh, mini tutor uh, that can help us to refine our ideas. So I see this as a great tool for increasing what we can do in the undergrad classroom.